Good morning, everybody. Good morning. If you guys to come on in, please stand. Come on in, please stand. We're going to sing some congregational songs, have some gifts to give God. It's kind of a special service. Uh, we'll uh, uh, get started this morning. Glad you guys are here with us. Glad you guys are joining us there on Facebook. As uh, people log in and get on, uh, we'll go ahead and sing some songs. The first one here is the old account that long ago. Uh, go ahead and hit it when you got it. We'll sing some songs.
by the blood of the Lamb. I go ahead, when you got it, now we can sing, and we'll go to the next part of the service now. Uh, 
Uh, one thing that I do have to uh, say, again, you'll notice we're not passing out an offering basket. If you'd like to put your guys' offering in the, in the box there, it'll be in the auditorium during the service. Brian, right after the service, we'll guys take to the uh, lobby where you can put your guys' offering in the box. Again, we're trying to minimize what we hand out, hand-to-hand uh, -hand contact. Um, also, you'll notice there's gloves and masks and, and uh, hand sanitizer, and Kleenex and everything else you may need out there in the lobby. You may make full use of that. Um, uh, uh, just, uh, just you know, make sure that we're not wasting, of course, if you need it. By all means, take it. Uh, that's what it's here for. Uh, so uh, that's all I have. Oh, remember to everybody try to scoot in. If you're on the wall section, scoot over to the wall. If you're in the middle section, squeeze in as much as you can with your family. Uh, we try to make, make sure that there's space for everybody. Uh, so when visitors come in, they don't have to walk past you uh, to find a seat. That, that's important. Uh, we will be dismissing the class in just a few moments. We have a couple songs we're going to the gifts now. Okay, we're going to hand out some gifts. First of all, all the mothers in the room, would you please stand? We'd like to honor you. We miss Mother's Day uh, because we were in quarantine, so we're going to take care of this today. Um, I need some young man to help pass this out. Young, strong, handsome. I mean, I'll compliment you all the ways you want. What we don't want. <laughs> anyway, any, there's, there's lots of, there's thousands of you in this room. We'll hand those out. We'll thank you for every woman. Yes, one, as soon as you get one of those ladies, you may be seated. Uh, that was like we can make sure everybody gets one. We do have three special gifts here. Uh, this is for the youngest married mother. Does everyone want to start with being the youngest married mother? Ms. Patty, how old is Ms. Patty? Oh, that's you. Is this Sarah? Sarah, how old is this, Sarah? You know how old you are? See how old you are? See how old you are? 35? Sarah, make everyone say their age. I'm 33. There you go. Anybody be 33? Yeah. Youngest man? Sister? Sarah? But Emma. No. No count. Sister? Sarah? Sister Sarah. 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 Sarah.
We can really move, if you will, over the hearts, lives, and minds of men, women, boys, and girls. I really believe seriously that's a good thing. When somebody counts on us the first to pray and fast, which I have also a verse I would ask the, uh, the church to pray and fast in order for situations. And I'm going to be honest with you, I've actually seen those God do something miraculous, if you will, and bring uh, people to where it is the verse that uh, uh, they're, uh, they're better off than they were before it is the verse we fasted and prayed. I mean, you know, that's a good thing if you know that saying that. When we've got young people who are wanting the verse of the church to fast and pray over situations they find themselves in, we find ourselves in what have you, as a church as a whole, and our families what have you. I don't know that's a good thing if you know that saying that. So if you would, that's my announcement. If you would, we'd appreciate that. Pick out a day, if you will, just to set aside fast, if you will, do the idea about just praying uh, on a regular basis for our church, if you will, to be able to get in there and do what it is that God would have you do.
walk with your finger so that we can step on. Where you walk in the glass. Walk in the glass. Okay? At this time, just look at your gun. Just look at your gun. Uh, give her a hand. Temptation. Uh, 
Uh, this is our fifth installment in this. Take a look at your middle, verse number 13. We're just going to kind of hit this thing and run. And what's interesting is that we kind of took a little bit of a turn, a little bit of a different turn uh, today, uh, this morning. I actually thought I was going to be able to, actually going to be preaching on, on another thought. Uh, but all of a sudden the Lord kind of showed me a couple of things that is we need to kind of step back and take care of. Take a look at real. Uh, verse number 13, James chapter 1 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. I mean, then, then, then when the lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. And do not err, my beloved brethren. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask God to bless today. If you would, Father, we pray this time we would touch the hearts, lives, and the minds of these that are gathered here today. Lord, I know there are some of these that are sick and not feeling well. I'm going to pray for them today. Also, those of that are on vacation, Lord, and traveling, I pray, Lord, that traveling mercies would be extended to them. And, Lord, we pray, Father, right now, that, Lord, that you would speak to the hearts of those of us that are listening right now, uh, Lord, uh, through uh, uh, live Facebook and also a little bit later on, Lord, on YouTube. And pray, the Lord, that you would speak to hearts, uh, uh, Lord, taking your word. Father, that it might be able to find lodging within their hearts, that they might bring forth that 30-fold, 60-fold, that 100-fold, Lord, that it might change and transform their lives by the power of God, Lord. We love you today. Thank you. Praise you. Ask all the precious name of Jesus and for a sacred prayer today. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 You may be seated there. Just right Thank you. Thank you. Uh, where's my time right? Uh, take a look at the middle of the verse. We're just going to do a little bit of an introduction right quick. Uh, the first century church, uh, the first uh, part of the series, if you will, was dealing with the idea about, about trials. The first century church had some problem with trials, and we know that because this is one of the first letters, if you will, that were written letters to the church. It was handed around, and you know, it was almost like a track. And the reason is because there were some problems, if you will, followers in that first century. The Apostle James was writing in that situation. But he's dealing with the idea about the word temptation, if you will. And they had a problem with that. Then all of a sudden, the, the meaning of temptation changes from the idea, we're going to get to that in a minute. It changes and it takes on all of a sudden, uh, now an evil meaning. No longer is it temptation in the idea about suffering trials, testings, trouble, tribulations, trauma, and tragedy. It's no longer that. Now it's moved, if you will, a little bit further in this chapter of the idea of, in other words, now it's a temptation of sin. It's taught, they gave the idea about trespass, about transgression, about treachery, if you will, about traitor. That's what Judas is actually called, if you will, in other words, there in the Bible. I mean, you know that sin got all over him, if you all know that, say amen. amen. Well, it's interesting. We know that Satan was behind that to some degree, but how I many knows the idea of it? We need to quit blaming it on the words of the Almighty. That's why he said, don't let nobody say that when I'm tempted, I'm tempted. But God, that's not the truth. Right. And when it talks about that, it says, therefore, when lust, you saw it, it's your lust that we're talking about. So quit blaming it on the, 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 the adversary, uh, if you will. Quit blaming it on Adam and Eve, if you will. Quit blaming it on or somebody. I mean, that was, it's you. It's you. It's you to stand in need of prayer. I like we sing so many times the idea. And listen, a lot of preachers, if you will, teachers and Christians constantly tell us that no, you can't live right for so many different reasons. It's the idea about the verse constantly, there's where it is, you can't live right because of the devil. You can't live right because of, in other words, uh, uh, because of, of your, yourself. And, and there's where it is immediately, the idea of the verse, we're just having a, a hard time with this whole thing. And there's constantly the, the ones that go, oh, man, you know, we're just sinners saved by grace. And I'll deal with that a little bit later on. Um, I, I've got the verse, that, I, you know how many times the word saint is mentioned in the Bible? 62 times. You want to know how many times sinner is actually mentioned towards the word somebody that was saved at one time? Less than a handful. We'll go through that one of these days. I just don't have time today. So why in the world is it the words that people aren't known as saints that are saved by grace? How come it's always sinners saved by grace? Coming through some mushed out mother's minister that sits there and tells us we can't not live right. That's not the truth by no stretch of the imagination. And somebody, somebody's got to get a hold of this. And the only way we can, somebody needs to preach this thing, teach this thing. So that's what James is writing about. The source, if you will, of faith temptation. First of all, don't blame it on the Lord. Let no man when he say what he's tempted, not tempted with God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. And there's the illustration of those of Adam and Eve. We're not going to turn back there to Genesis chapter 3. Those deal with this. Notice if you mark the idea. They blamed everybody. 
Adam started blaming the idea about Eve. He started blaming God and well, he's the, the woman that thou gave us. Eve turns around and points this thing over to Satan, doesn't she? Come on. Satan, if you got my friend, had nobody numbers to blame. And that's interesting. He didn't have no blame, nobody to blame in the heaven either. Come on. He was drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And therefore, when lust hath been seen, it bringeth forth sin, and sin was finished, brings forth death. Not only for him, but also a third of the angels is what Revelation chapter 12 tells us also. And we're not going to go back to that. I just thought I'd just give you a little bit of an introduction, if you will, in the middle of this whole thing. And notice how in other words that they blamed everybody. But the illustration of Job I love so much, Job blamed nobody. Yet though I guarantee you he went forth what, what went forth. He said, well, what are they, that, those are trials and tribulations and testings. Oh no, 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 no. That was a part of this thing. You nail it down. Satan made a deal with God, did he not? Yeah. He said, You let me take away numbers from his family, his finances. Let me take away from his fitness, if you will. Talk about his health. He said, You let me take that away. He'll cuss you to your face. Right. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. I'm just showing you how my friend, when Satan comes in on this whole day, it's all about sin. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the temptation turns away from trials, testings, and troubles and what have you like that. Then all of a sudden, it goes to sin, and there's where it is it's transgression, it's trespass. It's, oh, can't anybody see that if you can't say that? But you know what? Job. He did not blame the devil. That's right. He did not. He didn't blame nobody. Matter of fact, Bible says that in all this, it says Job. Mm -hmm. Job, if you will, my friend, never, never sinned with his lips. That's right. Nor did he charge God foolishly. That means the idea that he decided what he's going to do is he's not going to blame God. Come on. Then could he have blamed Satan? Sure he could have. I guess. But he knows this thing lays back in his lap, start to finish in no uncertain terms. He didn't blame nobody as far as that goes. He just said me, my friend, live like he's supposed to. Somebody else say amen. He didn't blame nobody. So don't blame the Lord. But you can blame your lusts. Notice if you will, but never man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. I want you to see the idea. Don't blame it on the, everlasting, on the Almighty, the everlasting. Don't blame it on the adversary, which is the devil, the evil one. Don't blame it, if you will, on, on, oh, okay, we'll get to that in a minute. How many hand on the idea about Satan? He couldn't have blame, blame nobody. Reason is, he's up there with everybody for all the angels, perfect start to finish. That's why it says in Ezekiel, he made this statement clear cut. He said, that was perfect in the way, he said, for in thy ways from the day that thou was, it says, created till and they can believe it's found in me. Somebody ought to say amen right there. He couldn't blame nobody. He couldn't blame nobody. But you know what about that? He said, sir, turn right around. He didn't blame anybody because he got nobody to blame. Right. And then all of a sudden he says, you know what? I'm going to spread this message out. And he turns away and gets a third, if you will, of the angels. A third of the angels, my friend. And they follow his pernicious ways. Drew that tail, my friend. A third of the angels, my friend, fell there that day. He's called, he said, angels. Yeah, the Bible says there was the devil and his angels. That's exactly what it says. Now let me go on. You turn to Isaiah, how art thou fallen from heaven to Lucifer? I mean, he knows he fell. There's no getting around that. But then all of a sudden, this is where the message changed for me this morning. And I was going to go on, my words, to deal with the idea about, about words, how it is it that people try to blame the mercy of their sin on how it is that God created them or, or how it is the mercy that they ended up falling. So, so I decided there was the idea. Uh, I, I'm not doing anybody any favors because what I'm doing is, is I'm not showing people how to overcome the devil. I'll show you a little bit later on how to come, overcome the worst sin in your life. How to have victory over sin in your life. But I, I need to show you we can have victory over the devil. You say, oh, wait, wait, wait. Did you the devil? Are you kidding me? You, uh, can we really have can we really have victory over the devil? I mean, that was the idea that we need to find out whether we can have victory over the devil. You know that same thing. So we're going to spend some time this morning, if you will, dealing with the idea of how you can have victory over the devil. How many here like to know how to have victory over the devil? Amen. If you would say anything, Amen. can I show you how easy it is? Yeah. And you're saying, easy? Are you kidding me? Well, I, I, I've been told, yeah, that's the problem. You've been told. Yeah. Well, you ain't read. Uh -huh. That's good. That's good. I, I, you, you've been told a whole lot of 
things. And I, I, I find it interesting. I want to surely do that. That in other words, I mean, uh, we got power over the devil. Yeah. Uh, we got power. And uh, we're, 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 let me just go through this right. Let me show you how easy it is. James, isn't that interesting? Who we're talking with? Uh, who we're dealing with here? James. James immediately shows us the idea uh, about the idea about the words of sin in chapter number one. And, got, and this temptation, he tells us the words in James chapter four. It said, "Submit yourselves therefore to God, and resist the devil, and he will." Flee from you. Now stop right there. Can I talk to y'all just a minute? Can I show you where the problem lays at, my friends, of what you've heard? How many here have heard the phrase, resist the devil and he'll flee from you? If you have, raise your hand. I said heard it, not read it. I'm talking about hearing it. Okay, let's put it down. Say it again. How many here knows that? Matter of fact, you've heard these gospel preachers up there say, oh, you just need to resist the devil. Oh, and he'll flee from you. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, the devil's beating up on them, some fears what happened, they think it was double. Like, what happened? I'm resisting what happened. The problem is, is nobody knows the verse. All they do is, is the idea that they just listen to preachers and never look up the idea of what they just got through saying. And especially the verse in some kind of context, if you will. Notice if you will, submit yourselves therefore to God. This is what they don't do. I mean, you know, there's a bunch of backsliders out there right now and sinners that are actually trying to resist the devil. Come on. And the idea they're getting beat up left and right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 19, it makes a clear cut statement. There were seven sons of Siva trying to cast the devil out of this one individual. Yeah. I mean, those, my friend, there's where it is that devil come out, no yeah. doubt. But the idea of beating, in other words, that those, I mean, I mean, beat them, they, they slapped them naked and hit their yeah. clothes. They run off naked as a jaybird, as you know, as far as that goes. Come on, somebody ought to say amen. Yeah. So how many of you know the idea? And they tried to resist the devil, didn't they? It didn't do them no good. It was a whole bunch of backsliders and a whole bunch of sinners trying to resist the devil, my friend. They're not submitting themselves to God. And they can't figure out why this is not working. Right. It's not working because they're not following the verse. Let's go to the truth. How about the idea resist the devil and he will flee from you? Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. That means the idea. Let's put the whole verse together. Somewhere along the line, people are going to say, oh, I'll submit my stuff to God. Just long enough to get the devil off my back. I mean, no, that ain't going to work. You can submit yourself all you want to, and you get the devil away from you. If you're not going to draw a line to God right after that, my friend, he won't draw a line to you. Come on. And I'm sick to death, my friend, to hear about the idea, oh, God never leave you nor forsake you. Have you ever read the whole Bible? You do realize, my friend, I, there, there, there's more verses that says if you forsake the Lord, he'll forsake you. But the idea about the idea about uh, that God never leave you nor forsake you. Just look at the second chronicles, I think it is, as far as that goes. Uh, first Chronicles, Kings, if you will, David told Numbers his son, you don't live right, you nail this thing down, there's what it is. You forsake God, he'll forsake you also. Amen. But we never hear that. Never hear that. Yet though the Bible is clear about teaching that. A little bit further. Draw an eye to God. Draw an eye to God. He'll draw an eye to God. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. There's one time that verse is needed. That verse calls sinners. Come on. Yeah. Others in the context of those it is that are possibly saved. I'll give you that one. It's still a handful, though. Compared to 62 times the word saints are mentioned. Come on. He said, in other words, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. I mean, you know the idea about being double-minded, my friend. You have to stay with all your ways. Yeah, right. I mean, I know this double-mindedness, my friend, it is the words, not what it is. It's needed by no stretch of the imagination. This is part of the problem. This up and down, this in and out, this double-mindedness, what have you, what have you. I mean, you know, that's not what it is. It's needed by no stretch of the imagination. Matter of fact, James has already told them, because we're in chapter 4 here. Now in chapter 1, it says, a double-minded man is unstable, what's it say? In all its ways. How many of you know the idea about change, in other words, in a life, if you will, of a Christian, my friend, needs to be progressive. It needs the idea about the words changing the words for the betterment of an individual. That's how you grow. Amen. Come on, somebody, somebody needs to say amen. How about that idea? I, I'm worried about people, my friend, that have change in their life, but it's not change it is, it's, it's any good. When all of a sudden somebody changes the words, well, let me show you something about this. Uh, uh, can I give you guys a little bit of a help? Proverbs 24, 21 says, my, my son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to, what's it say, change. How many of you know, if you know a Christian that's changing, come on, 
In other words, they're not changing for the better. I mean, those, you need to get away from them as those individuals. Somebody ought to say amen. And if all of a sudden, and by the way, I, I use the illustration on a regular basis, don't I? About there was a, 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 a preacher coming into my office many, many years ago, and there was a reason me that he asked me the question. He said, I got a question to ask you before I sat down. He said, Have you changed? And I sat there and I said, No, I haven't. What are you talking about? And he talked about there was a bunch of old preachers that had changed, my friend, in so many different things in their convictions, their standards, their practices, and their Bibles and everything else. So like, I mean, in other words, that's not a good thing. Right. He sat down, and in other words, and thank the Lord it is, in other words, that I have not changed. You know what the problem is? He turned around and changed also. And I, I, but this is where it is the idea. The change, my friend, is we need to make sure that we're not ended up changing, if you will, my friend, of the, about, about our Bible. I mean, in those words, you've got a different Bible than what it is, my friend, you had at one time about the King James Version. I mean, no, that change is not good. Right. You're going away. And by the way, you say, well, if, if, something, if somebody's not growing, they're dying. And by the way, I'm right now, if you change your idea about the Bible, my friend, yes, you are dying. Matter of fact, you're going to end up dying and going to hell is what the Bible says. When it makes a state of the idea, you add to or take away. And you say, well, I didn't, know. I didn't publish that Bible. Yeah, but you're using it. Right. And you're putting your stamp of approval on it by using it. Those that isn't have added to it, take it away. I mean, you know, the Bible says if you take away out of the Word of God, your, your name's going to be taken out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Right. You'll, you're not growing. You'll die. Right. So just in case you want, same thing about music. All of a sudden, that gives you a little bit of country. You're a little bit rock and roll. You got a little low town deep down deep in your soul as far as that goes. I mean, you know, you, you change. You just start changing in the right direction. Oh, well, I think maybe I'm just growing, if you will, in the way. No, you're not growing in the way. Matter of fact, what you're doing, you're going astray. Yeah. That's what you're doing. You're not, getting, you're, not, you're not growing. You're dying. All the idea about you're suffering fools gladly. That means the idea that you could care less what somebody believes. Couldn't care less. You'll support and actually go with your little churches, my friend. Believe once saved, always saved. Matter of fact, instead of going to a free will Baptist church, there's a whole bunch of good ones around, aren't there? No, there isn't. But nonetheless, though, I got to go back to the idea. Why in the world would you want to suffer fools gladly, my friend, about somebody by bring, preaching false doctrine? The idea about damnable heresies. Why in the world you, you, you change all you want to? It's not for the better. Matter of fact, as far as I'm concerned, you're not growing, you're dying. The idea about merging all of a sudden your family, you're losing your family, you become a bolster, you're proud, you're a blasphemer, you're, you're, you're dying, you're not growing. You care how you look at it. Right, amen. And that all comes from a, a person being a double minded man. Yeah. Right. A double minded man, you're unstable of all your ways. That's why it permeates your whole life, right. start to finish. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm trying to show you. You, need, you, you, want to, you, want to, you want to resist the devil and flee from How many of you like to get the devil away from you? If you wouldn't say amen. amen. Well, you need to submit yourself to God. Yeah. You need and you submit yourself. If you resist him, God says he'll flee from yeah. you. The thing you need to draw an eye to God, he'll draw an eye to you. Yeah. You need to cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Because you're double-minded in one way, my friend. You're double-minded in every way. Slowly but surely they'll find that out. If they'll just look. How many of you know the idea of Ephesians chapter 6? Turn over there right quick. Uh, we're going to be here a little, we're going to be here a little while. Ephesians chapter 6. I want you to take a look at something I think is interesting for us to take a look at. Ephesians chapter 6. Now take a look if you will. And the Bible says, put on the whole armor of God. How many of you know the idea? The whole armor of God has got quite a few pieces. Yeah. Matter of fact, Sister Sarah, uh, just to get a thing that was on the whole armor of God. Uh, all you ladies and what have you, all take a look at that. Uh, what it is in other words they got there. She's you know, probably done a pretty good job with that. But let's, let's just run through it just, just quickly. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? Well, let's go back into context. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, not yours. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. How I many of you know the idea? You don't put that armor on, the devil's going to chew you up and speak and spit you out. Just in case you're wondering, just go to it just quickly. We're not, we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but I think we need to say uh, how, how we do it. If we go. It says, well, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. By the way, if you're wrestling against flesh and blood, you're in the wrong back. Right. I don't know about you, but that's exactly where a lot of people, Christians find themselves. They're actually wrestling against flesh and blood. That's not where the Bible is at. That's not where the battle's at. 
And I'll tell you, I remember years ago uh, in, in our home, in other words, when we lived over in that other place over there in Chapter, uh, there's where it is a, a family came in and they were sitting down and they began to start to talk. If you go, sort of back down from Brother Haynes. And how long do you know that didn't last very long? I stood up and I said to her, I said, Partner, your problem is that you're wrestling against flesh and blood. And I said, if you bring me up the words of the idea about accusations, if you will, against Brother Haynes, you're wasting your time here in this household. Good. They stood up right quick. They started heading towards the front, front door because they knew it was over with. We're not doing that. It's good. We're not going to do that. Right. He's wrestling against flesh and blood. Let him do it out. Well, his problem, my friend, was principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the war he should have been fighting That's for, right. if yeah. you will. We, we escorted them right out the front door along with their kids also. There's where the meeting. We sat there and said, yeah, you get the kids all out of here also. We walked them out the front door and they were there. The problem is... They're uh, wrestling against flesh and blood. Yeah, that's right. That's not where your problem is. It never has been. Never will be. It never will be. He said the verse against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He said, wherefore, take of you the whole armor of God. That means all of it. Some people have got part, part of it on there, but how many of those people have they got the whole armor of God on? They haven't got every piece they need. Every piece, my friends, got a point of purpose to it. How about the idea, he says, uh, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all to stand, was to say, stand therefore. Mm -hmm. I mean, by the way, if you're ever going to make a stand, take a stand, and just stand, you need to make sure, my friend, you've got all the armor of God on that you need to start to finish. This says, stand therefore, having your loin, your, your loin spurred about the truth, having the breastplate of righteousness. Hey, how many of you know, my friend, you don't have that garden, how many of you know, you ain't going to fight very long. I said, you're not going to fight very long. Yeah. Somebody stabbed you in the lung, you'll collapse. Somebody stabbed you in the heart, you're gone. That's why you need the breastplate of righteousness. Having your Lord's word about the truth. How I many of you know you need to protect yourself? Amen. I need to go there. Uh, how many of you know the idea you need to protect yourself? Having your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means the idea, my friend, you've got the gospel of peace on verse. Put it on. Shoes on verse. What, what's the point of shoes? Walk it. You need to start walking over soul and door knock and crowd reach ministry and everything's going. What door knock? Right. With what? The gospel of peace. Yeah. Come on, somebody ought to say amen. Yeah. It says, above all, let's put on the shield of faith. Yeah. Wherewith you may be able to uh, able to, to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I mean, you know, he's gonna throw some fiery stuff at you. You need yourself the shield of faith to be able to guard yourself, my friend, as a whole, start to face. We're not talking about other words, no pipe late. Shield. We're not talking about the words no garbage can shield. You said well, not that big around, you hold with a hand like that, bang, 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 bang. Remember what you did with his kids? Yeah. No, uh, you guys probably had a real thing. <laughs> well, that was a Raised up that man, I tell you what, you you know, you got a biscuit and you use it for a yo-yo and everything else. <laughs> if you can find strength. <laughs> I was so poor. How poor? I had trouble paying attention. Pain. Okay. <laughs> also, I lived way, way out there in the bones. Huh? How, How far? far? I, I, well, I lived so far out, the June bugs didn't come out until April. I mean, April. I'm sorry. <laughs> until, until August. <laughs> Salvation, thinking you're going to be able to hurt somebody 
Matter of fact, you how many know you're really, really vulnerable about that at that time? Yeah. How about they take the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and then the idea about praying always. That's seven pieces out, my friend, of armor with that prayer. You say, well, what is what's the idea about prayer? I mean, you know, it's modern day, I like it. Actually, prayer, my friend, is the idea about having a, a calm on. That means the idea that you can speak, it's prayer, and all of a sudden there's where it is you can hear, in other words, what the master, if you will, tell you what to, what to do. Yes. So, somebody ought to say amen there. That's the prayer what we're talking about. I mean, you know, this is what it is we need. If you know that, say amen. Now, let me go on. Let me go on right quick. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to go back to my outline. Right? Yeah, that, that's the idea. This is how you overcome the devil. How I many of you know the idea we need to figure out how to, and by the way, you don't put the words the whole armor of God on. You're nothing but a chicken dummy for the devil. That's, right. that's all you want. Right. You don't have yourself a sword and a spear, my friend. You ain't going to be able to sneak or stab him, my friend, any way you want. Remember, it's a two-edged sword. It, cut, it cuts coming and going, if you will. Notice, if you will, a little bit further, how about the idea? Revelation chapter 12. Why don't you turn there if you'd like to, if you would also. Revelation chapter number 12. And this is the verse talking about the verse in the context of the idea about the devil. There's no doubts about that. That's not what it's going to do. Revelation chapter 12, verse number 11. The context, if you will, that they overcame him. Well, who's him? Well, if you go back to our, con our, our context, we talked about that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called, pulled out the devil of Satan. Remember what we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Which deceiveth him. What does it say? The whole world. I mean, that's the idea that that's one powerful creature yeah. when he can sit there and deceive the verse, the whole world. But you know what's interesting is the idea, my friend, you don't have to be deceived. But in other words, the whole world is going to end up being deceived by him. He was cast out to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of this Christ for the accuser of the brethren is cast down. That's why I talk about the adversary, also the accuser of the brethren. I mean, he you knows he's constantly accusing the yeah, brethren. Yeah. And the guy he ain't lying about you. Sometimes he's telling the truth. Come on. Now he accused Job of the idea. You let me touch his finances, family, and his fitness, and he'll cuss you to his face. Now that wasn't the truth. He was accusing Job, in other words, of serving God only for what he could get from God. So, I mean, no. know. But sometimes when he accuses the brethren, he's got, in other words, something to accuse them with. Amen. Come on. Amen. Come on. Can I give it to you, though? So how am I supposed to overcome the devil? I'm glad you asked. Notice if you will, he accuses them before our God day and night. So if you think somewhere along the line the devil will give up on you, you're crazy. He's going to constantly, my friend, come around in church services. Uh, if you will, at your house, and your home, at your work, and what have you on that line. He's going to constantly sit there and accuse you before God. Come on, how many knows the idea that, my friend, make sure it is the words you've got. You, you know how to overcome the devil. If you ready for that, say amen. Context verse 11. And they overcame him, talk about the devil, by the blood of the Lamb. Let me talk to you right quick. If he ever accuses you of sin and it's the truth, guess what you need? You need the blood of the Lamb. Come on. You don't need works because you can't work your sin off. Come on. You can't pay your sin off. You can't work for it. You'll wait. You can't wage for it. Come on. Can't do it. Can't work for it. You need the blood of the Lamb. And this side give my words, oh, I just plead the blood. I plead the blood. Hey, listen. Plead the blood all you want to. Blood, my friend, has got for one purpose and one point. Yeah. It's the idea of my friend to take care of sin, just in case you're wondering. He said, I will they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That means the idea. It says, and this is what it boils down to. First John chapter number one, verse number seven says this. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. In the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son cleanses us from all sin. Take the blood, my friend, every time you want to. It deals with sin. Somebody, somebody ought to say amen. He accuses you of sin, my friend, and it's the truth as far as that goes. You need the blood. Amen. You need the blood. If you ever want to overcome him, you need the blood. Come on. And then that's not all. It says about the word of the testimony. I mean, one of the most powerful tools in your arsenal is your testimony. Every time the Apostle Paul got in front of somebody, 
he used his testimony. Come on. Every time he got in front of a king and what have you, he wanted to give him the testimony. He said, well, I go out visiting what have you. I don't want to tell him. Tell him your testimony. That's how you can overcome the devil. Some people are, well, I don't want to go out because I don't know the Bible that way. I don't know if they ask me a question. I don't know. It gives you the ability to come back. I might give him an answer. Over the last 40 years of me out so many door knocking hours, if you don't think somebody had to ask me something, I didn't have an answer to, are you kidding me? He said, what'd you do? I used it not as, as a stumbling block. I used it as a stepping stone to turn around and come back and let them know what I found out about what they asked. Come on. But in the meantime, I gave my testimony. Amen. Just like the apostle, the greatest lion, my friend, that could ever be imagined is the Lord Jesus Christ used them. 14 books of the New Testament. And all that wisdom, if you've got all that godly wisdom, as far as that goes. And what does he do when he gets before people? He gives them a testimony. I don't know about you, but I love that. I most surely do. I love it. Well, then he preached them uh, righteousness and judgment and uh, stuff like that. He showed me. He most surely did. And he still gave his testimony. You want to show what it is that God had done in his life as far as that goes. Let me, let me hurry. It says, they overcame it by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives. How long? How long? Right on up to death. One of the biggest problems with my friend of Christians that can't overcome the devil, they love their lives too much. They're too stinking worldly. They're saving their life and they're losing their soul. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I mean, knows that's, that's good stuff. Amen. We need to find out how to overcome the devil. Amen. And I guess that's what God, the first person called me this morning and said, yeah, you're going to get into that other stuff maybe tonight or Wednesday or whatever else on that line. But right now, one of the things that you haven't done is you haven't told them how to overcome the devil. You're just making this thing just the idea about you just throwing this stuff out there. And that's all fine and dandy. You need to show my people how to overcome the devil. And so, as I'm looking at this, and I'm writing stuff down last night, man, I started getting on myself a yellow pad out and started writing stuff down. And I, I pulled that out this morning, threw it over there, thought I'd get to it. Some of my hand and said, yeah, first thing this morning, you need to tell them people how to overcome the devil. You tell them that there's the idea that this is, oh, you just don't, don't blame the devil, what happened on that line. And they're, they're being uh, accosted, accused. They're, they're, they're his adversary, like a roaring lion, going about seeking who he may devour. He does it all the time. So, how many of those we need to figure out how to overcome the devil? You know that, say amen. amen. Well, that's the idea. Yeah, you, you, you need the blood. Amen. If you've got sin in your life, you need the blood. By the word of their testimony, you need your testimony to be rich and real on, on your lips. You ought to be able to tell your testimony in three minutes. 30 minutes or three hours. You say, well, boy, that, well those are good business. The 30 minute, the three hours. Do you remember that one time I was over there? Oh my goodness, that's why the probably lady ain't never going to come here. She said, that dude, man, three hours. We go a little bit further with this thing. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, we've been there. How about, how about, how about, let's, let's let the Lord show you how to get, how, how to deal with the devil. Can we do that right quick? Yeah. I got just a few minutes. We we will hit it. We'll, we'll hit it right quick. Um, look, 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 let's take a look at that Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter four. If you'd like to turn there, you certainly will do so. And if I do this right, you get there sooner. Matthew chapter four. It says, "Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil." Does this fit in the verse of what we're dealing with? And matter of fact, I find it interesting. Here's where it is. The Lord Jesus Christ, in chapter 3, the last several verses, for context's sake, is the idea. He just got baptized. I mean, he knows whatever it is. You're obedient to God. You may have say that the devil is just right around the corner. Right. He's anointed to be with the Holy Ghost. How many of you know this? Immediately, my friend, whenever the anointing comes on you, the attack is right there, right, yeah, right next. Right. The anointing and the, the attack. You ready for this? Yeah. Let's see if you know how the Lord did this. He says, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, how many of you know the idea? It, it's important that we're fast. Uh, this is where somewhere in my life, watch this, the devil actually thought he was probably weakened. In other words, since he was fasting. That's the 
That's just exactly the opposite. Whenever you fast, that's when all of a sudden the power, the yoke-breaking power comes upon your life. Isaiah 58 talks about it, the fasting, the kind you're supposed to do, it breaks the yoke. Yeah. I don't have time to go through that. Fasting 40 days, and afterward it says he was in hunger. And it says, and when the tempter came to him, notice what it is he's called there. The tempter. He said, if. I mean, no, watch this. The devil is always doubting everything. Right. He's always wanting you to doubt something about the Son of God. Come on. Right. The scriptures of God. The service of God. Does anybody get this thing? He's always wanting you to doubt that. He said, if. He said, he said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made, what does it say? Right. Lust of the flesh. Right. He's getting to the lust of the flesh. He actually believes the idea the appetites, if you will, the desires of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to work against him. He's been fasting for 40 days. So all of a sudden when he makes the statement, watch this, he said... He said, why don't you command that these stones be made bread? When he said that, the Lord Jesus Christ looked down, if you will. He seen those rounded stones, and there's where it is. They look like a, a fresh baked loaf of bread. I mean, the devil wants to make things look good. That's what he did to Eve. He showed her that fruit, did he not? Yeah. He said it, was, it looked good. Yeah. You know what it says? Yeah. Pleasant. Yeah. He says to the eyes. <clears throat> now notice what the Lord Jesus Christ does. But he answered and said, it is written. How I many of you know that's the key to the situation? Yeah. It's the key, if you will, to the idea, my friend, the word of God is something, my friend, if you're ever going to overcome the devil, if you're ever going to beat the devil, you're going to have to know the word of God. Yeah. I guarantee you, if you don't know the Word of God, you don't read the Word of God, you don't know the Word of God or anything like that, you are going to be chewed up and spit out by the devil on a regular basis. If you find yourself constantly, my friend, having a double grade a hassle, if you will, the idea about the devil or tempting you, constantly causing you, my friend, to sin or consider it or anything else in my life, and you need to get in the Word of God. The Bible makes a statement that says that it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now watch this. You say, well, where'd that come from? How about the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, and verse number 3? You will find something very, very interesting about this. If i got time enough to do it, I'm just going to take it just for right now. So there's where it is immediately. He's quoting out the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 3. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Here's a question to you. Is the word of God so... So, if you will, important to you that you esteem it above the words your necessary food. Did you like to quote the verse? Yeah. Yeah. So, you quote it out of the book of Job. It means the idea that Job, my friend, you nailed it. By the way, that's why Job was able to overcome the devil like he was. To the point where he didn't even bother the verse to, to, to blame this whole situation on the devil. He esteemed his word above his necessary food. The Bible talks about the idea about the, the food being bread. It's nourishment for you. Talks about it being sweet. Talks about it being, talks about it being, if you will, or something that uh, is uh, 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 appealing, if you will, uh, uh, like, <clears throat> like dessert. And every time somebody buys me, in other words, uh, I have a little, those little fun size, out the joys or something like that. Let's, let's do some butter fingers from here on out, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you say, well, so what is your point? Well, I don't know about you, but every time somebody buys me a sick bag of Butterfinger or out the joys, first of all, I know where they're at, and I guarantee you every time I walk in the kitchen, it's just something just drawing me. And I don't know why they call them fun size. They're not fun to me. You <laughs> say, why is that? Well, you have to tear a package open. You got to eat about four or five of them before you can ever get this. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the regular size, <laughs> like that. So they're not fun to me. Mm -hmm. I like I like that the, the paydays are about that big, about yeah, that wide. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Feel like they like a banana. <laughs> oh, but how many of you know the idea? I'm in there sitting there, and we're watching television or something like that, or being with my loving wife. 
And immediately my mind goes to Butterfinger. Three days. And I'll enjoy it. And immediately the urge when the commercial comes on. Come on. I'm gonna watch the commercial. I'm gonna go make a commercial. <laughs> I can sell some Butterfinger. Do you, do you treat the verse of the Word of God like that? That every time you turn around, the words you grab your phone up like that, and you're, you're punching, other words, your Bible out, right quick, to quick, come on. To get a little, little bit of a, a little bit of dessert, if you will. Come on. That every time the words you turn around, the words you're, uh, so I, I, I can't read my Bible, I'm going to have 15 minutes a day, but I can watch four hours of, of television. I mean, you know, you know what you're telling the Lord? You're telling the Lord the resource with his when it comes to his word, it's not that important. And that's exactly why a lot of people have a lot of problems, I guarantee you with the devil. A lot of trouble with their own life, period. Thy word have I hid my heart, that I might not sin against thee. It's got more things that it, it, it'll do in your life if you'll allow it to do so. I don't know about you, but I guarantee you that's exactly what needs to happen. You just constantly over flipping over, if you will, on your phone or get your little New Testament, if you will, or like I said, the, the, the one app it is that I've got, the version of Paul's got, that we've got. Man, that thing, man, you can find stuff in a heartbeat. Right. It just needs to be something constantly in the word that you, you're meditating in his word day and night. Right. You know, it says, and then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. Can I, can, I just, can I just hit this thing kind of run right quick? Because I want to wrap this up. I've only got about five minutes. Um, I, 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 think it's, I think it's important for us to realize what he did was here. This is here the pride of life. Yeah. You say, why do you believe that? Well, when he put them on the pinnacle of the temple, that meant that everything that there was in the temple pointed towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was hoping, watch this now, he was hoping, listen to me now, he was hoping that he would go to his head. That everything that there was in that temple pointed towards him. Every single piece of furniture there was, start to finish, pointed towards the Lord Jesus Christ. He was hoping it would go to his head and he would sit there and say, you need to cast yourself down. For it is written, I find this interesting, now the devil is quoting verses? Are you kidding me? You say, well, what verse did he quote? Well, they cast. How about Psalm 91, verse 11? He said, do you mean the devil quotes verses? Yeah. Oh, yeah. False teachers, yeah. false prophets. Right. Come on. They quote the word of God just like anybody else does. The problem is, is the idea they're twisting the scriptures to their own destruction, too, by the way. Right. I really need to quote. I need, I need, I need I come back to this. Tonight, I, I need to I need to quit. So, so, say, so, well, what did what did the Lord Jesus Christ do? Well, what he did was he straightened it out like right? in verse number seven it says, as it is written, what he say again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Well, where do you get that verse from? I'm glad you asked. How about Deuteronomy chapter six? He stayed in the book of Deuteronomy, isn't he? He's not moving out of the book of Deuteronomy. Can I text him right now? He doesn't move out of the book of Deuteronomy. Say, what's your point? You know what would be a good thing for you to do? Is master, if you will, one book of the Bible. Yeah. You say, okay, well, I'll do a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> of course you will. And I bet you can quote John 11.35 real good to you, can't you? Jesus. Master, if you will, one book of the Bible. Make sure it's a, I won't say a good book of the Bible. They're all good. <laughs> you know what I mean. Let me read. He says, it's written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. We well, say, well, how does that answer what he quoted out of Psalm 91? Well, what he was trying to do is he was trying to get a, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus to tempt the Lord. The only place you're supposed to test the Lord at is in your tithing. Right. Hello, right? Well, that went quiet right then, didn't it? 
He said, in words, if you don't think it is that I can't bless you, go ahead. Try me. That's exactly what he said. He said, pay your time and your offerings. He said, I'll pour you out a blessing that you can't hold. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Go ahead. As a matter of fact, some of you in this room right now, you couldn't pay, you couldn't pay your house payment when you first came to this church. Come on. And I guarantee you, now you've got more money you know what to do with it. He said, well, what, well what, what, how did he twist Psalm 91? What he's trying to get the Lord to do, and anybody else that will, is to tempt God. Well, what's the verse saying? You're supposed to trust God, not tempt Him. Right. If you have found yourself in a situation of where it is, in other words, you might be in danger, He's given His angels charge over thee. It's not talking about the idea of jumping up, getting up in a, a, on a high building and jumping off and saying, well, I'm a child of God. God's going to come out. No, he ain't. You're going you're to bounce like a rubber ball and you're going to bust open like a watermelon. A super light watermelon. Just like Jezebel did. And they threw her down. She bounced about three times. She bust open like a... What? <laughs> throw her down. Throw her down three times. Yeah. She bust open like a watermelon. And when their story is dirty, Harry went, I mean, uh, J.D. went over to go eat a little bit and he came back and put yeah. nothing left in the version of but the, but the palms of her hands. Come uh -huh. on. Oh, was it the soles of her feet or something like that? Let me, let me hurry. The devil again taketh him up into a seating high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, the glory thereof. This is the lust of the eyes. He said, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down. Did you know what? Everything's down. Where was the stones at? Float in the air? Where were they at? On the ground. He wants you to look down. Then all of a sudden, he got him up in the temple, pinnacle of the temple, in a high place like that. He wants you to fall down. Jump down. And then here he's wanting you to fall down. And he said, He worship me. You know what's so interesting about this whole situation, really? It's the idea the Lord knew the idea that everything was going to be his anyway. Yeah. Can you wait? See, some people can't wait. And so when the devil comes along and says, hey, uh, you know, you can have this and you'll just do what I want you to do. Or don't do it. Just don't do what the Lord wants you to do. And I'll make sure you get it. The Lord had a word for him. He said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, There it is, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only was to say, Thou shalt serve. And that's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Is that good? Yeah. He stayed in one book of the Bible. Can I talk to you before we close today? You want to know how to overcome the devil? You need to put all the whole armor of God on. You need to know the word of God. Yeah. You need to use the blood of the Lamb. In other words, you've got sin in your life. Yeah. Come on. You need to have a testimony of the Lord. And you need to quit loving your life so much it is that the numbers are jury. That what you're doing is the numbers are you're, you're You're turning around and, and what you're doing is, is you're saving your life. And you turn around the version, you're actually losing your soul. Let's bow our heads. With our heads bowed, eyes closed, and no one knows about Christians' brain. Uh, I won't speak to the verse of the audience that's listening to me right now or maybe by YouTube later on. Listen, I really believe seriously the biggest problem with folks right now is they think that they can't overcome the <coughs> world of devil. Yes, you can. It's easy enough to deal with. Just submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw near the Lord. He'll draw near to you. But the reason why it is that you can't is the idea of this, this, this double-mindedness. That's not going to help. Put that whole armor of God have yourself a testimony. Know the word of God if you will. And I think it's so important for you to do just exactly that. But in fact, why don't you go ahead and turn that off here, brother? Let's stand together.